Well, I just want to kind of show you some things that I can do uh, if, if, if I can't be a pastor anymore. I could put on a glove. But I can pick things up with this glove that people don't always realize. So I've got this little bat. Okay, just a minute. Got this little bat. No, no, no. Okay. No, 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 no. I can do it by myself. Okay, just, just a minute, guys. Hold on. Because this is really a cool, cool trick. It's just... Pen should be... No, pen's not. Okay. Joel, can you give me a hand? Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Joel. I sure appreciate that. A lot of us as Christians live the Christian life like we have a glove on. And we try to live the life we've been called to live by our own power and our own strength. And sometimes we try to live that life out of our own emptiness and and, and our weakness instead of in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're we're trying to do these things that that we want to do and and that God has called us to do and, and, and yet we can't do it. If you think I'm doubt, uh, that, that, that I'm crazy, that that's not true, I, I encourage you just to look at the, the, the weakness, the apathy of the Christian church throughout the world. We just see it. it, it, it especially in the Western world. Uh, the church in, in, in uh, Asia is growing. The church in Africa is growing. But it seems to be in the Western world we're just not seeing that. And so that may be why, as as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, why he tells them to, to, to be filled with the Spirit. Now understand something very, very clearly. I'm sure you know it, that, that this letter is written to the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus. It's written to people who are already Christians. And yet he is saying to them, be filled with the Spirit. Well, as we talked about last week, aren't we already filled with the Spirit? Like when we become Christians, when we give our lives to Christ, aren't we filled with the Spirit? Well, we've received the Spirit We've received all of the spirit we're going to get. The question is, as I said last week, has the spirit received all of us? And that's what it means to be filled with the spirit. And in Ephesians 1.1, Paul makes it very, very clear who he's writing to. And he says to the saints who are at Ephesus. And saints is always a word in the Bible addressed to Christians. And so he's writing this to the saints at Ephesus, the people who are Christians. And and he says, not only are are you saints, but you are faithful in Christ Jesus. You're faithful in Christ Jesus. So these are faithful saints. These are saints who are faithful. And he still tells them a few chapters later that they are to be filled with the Spirit. He's writing to people like you. And he's writing people to people like me and saying, Beloved, you must be filled with the Spirit. And, 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 and in commanding us, and it is a command, in commanding us to be filled with the Spirit, you know what he's saying? He is saying to us that obviously some of us, maybe many of us, are not filled with the Spirit. Why would he say be filled with the Spirit if we already were? And it's because maybe we're not. Maybe we're not filled with the Spirit. We have the Spirit through salvation, but maybe we're not filled with that Spirit. I think all of us can can identify with the fact that we can be a Christian and yet be spiritually empty. Could I even suggest that we could love Jesus and still be spiritually empty? 
I think we've all experienced times like that, and, and it's confusing for us. Just because we're born again, just because we have this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within us, doesn't mean that we are filled with the Spirit. In fact, I think that they're kind of two different relationships. I think being having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a little bit different experience than being filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit means that I have personally surrendered to the Spirit and, 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 and being filled with the Spirit and being filled with power as the Spirit takes charge of our lives. Do we allow him to take charge of our lives? Do we? I think sometimes we're actually... You know how they talk about self-made millionaires and self-made people? Sometimes I think that we like to be self-made. We can be proud of the fact that I'm self-made. And what we really want, beloved, is we want to be spirit-made. We want to make sure that what we do is surrendered to the spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, Do not be drunk with wine, as as Dharma read earlier. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. And again, it's a command. It's saying, be filled with the Spirit. Again, suggesting that maybe we are sometimes not filled with the Spirit. It's in the present tense, which simply means this. It is telling us to continually be filled with the Spirit. So as I shared with you last week, my experience of the filling of the Spirit took place in our basement, in our home. I I didn't know anything about this stuff. And so I was reading a book, and in the book, they gave a suggested prayer to pray for the filling of the Spirit. And that was about a year and a half after I came to Christ. And in that time, I loved Jesus. I was trying to live for him, but I was trying in my own power. You see, I had accomplished some things in my life. I graduated second in my class with my criminology degree. I, I, I was the youngest treatment supervisor ever hired by the Saskatchewan Alcoholism Commission. I, I, I had accomplished things in my life before I was ever a Christian. So I thought that I could accomplish living the Christian life on my own. If I could do these things, surely I could live the Christian life by myself. If I just kind of gritted my teeth and really pushed and pushed and pushed. And I strove and I strove and I strove or strived or whatever. I could do it. And what I discovered in that year and a half was that I couldn't do it. I was always guilty, always frustrated, always discouraged because I wasn't living for Jesus, even though I wanted to. And so the Spirit, we want to surrender to him in such a way that he leads us continually. And when we do that, we will discover that there are some results in our life, positive results. And there are some blessings that we get. Now the three we're going to talk about this morning are not the only ones. Because Galatians 5 tells us that we receive the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We receive all of those things. But I just want to talk about three this morning. I, I want us to see that the presence of the Spirit within us produces an inward result. The inward result of joy. The inward result of joy. In verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. As believers, we live a life that is filled with joy. We have this inner joy within us. And and one way that that is seen in our life, and again, there are many ways, but what Paul is talking about here is singing. I appreciated what Harrison said this morning, that the joy, the enthusiasm of your singing. 
It, it, it tells us something about the joy that we have. As Christians, we love to sing, making melody in our heart to the Lord in our, all of our hearts. A singing heart is a joyful heart. And, and I, I will admit to you, uh, a confession time, that when I'm driving down the highway, coming here, and in an hour or so when I head home, I sing. Now, I prefer to do it alone, because I, you know, I don't want to embarrass those who aren't as good a singer as me. <laughs> I sing, along with the tapes, and, and the, or whatever, your CDs, and, and all those kinds of things. If, if the Holy Spirit fills our lives, and he, then he fills our lives with heart, with our, and our hearts with joy. Psalm 33 verse 1 says, Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. And when joy fills our heart, it's only fitting that that, that, that praise would come from our hearts, from our lives, from our mouths. And so it isn't just singing, but that's what he's talking about here. Psalm 96 verse 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. We just sing because we can't hardly stop it. Can't hardly not do it because we're so much joy in our hearts. Again, believers praise God in their hearts, their lives, their mouths, including the song that overflows our hearts. Do you ever have that happen? Or, or maybe you're praying or you're reading something in the Word, as Harrison talked about this morning, and, and, and all of a sudden there's this joy that just fills your heart. And you go, wow, God, you are so, so good. And we're just overflowing with joy. And so sometimes, maybe you even do that in your own personal devotional time. Maybe you just start to sing. Sing out loud. All by yourself. Because something just takes a hold of you. But we're not performing for an audience. When we sing here on Sunday mornings, we're not singing for one another. We're singing to one another, maybe, but we're singing for the Lord. And there are a lot of motivations for singing. Fame, to become famous. I know some Christian singers who have switched sides because they wanted the fame that didn't come with being a Christian singer. They wanted the materials, the wealth that didn't come with being a Christian singer. You could have the most beautiful, best trained voice in history. And you might even sing Christian songs sometimes. But I'm here to tell you that they're not necessarily worship songs. Because worship songs involve the heart. And we can sing all the right words, but it's not worship because our heart isn't in it. I mean, how many secular singers put out Christian albums? Or, sorry, uh, Christmas albums? Everybody in their dog. Although my favorite is Willie Nelson, but anyway. And, 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 and if we don't sing out of the overflow of this joy in our heart, here's the beautiful thing about just loving to sing for God. And I, for one, I'm very thankful for this. It doesn't have to be in tune, and it doesn't have to be good. I love that God calls us to make a joyful noise, not a good noise. Because I am such a bad singer, Bob Dylan makes me look good. 
makes me look bad. But when we sing with this joyful heart, it's because we love Jesus. And we just want to sing of our love to him. He's blessed us so much. And we want to show him that joy by walking in his spirit. And again, it's not just because of what we sing. It's because we sing to the Lord. Again, we sing among brothers and sisters every time we're together. But our audience is the Lord. We're filled with joy. And what comes out of our our mouths as a result of that joy is psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's like we just can't hold it back. So, so as a result of being filled with the Spirit, living in His presence, we have this, this inward result of the joy of the Lord. But Paul certainly doesn't stop there. He says that the presence of the Spirit within us produces an upward result. Gratitude. Being filled to overflowing with gratitude, with thankfulness for what God has done in our lives. Verse 20 says, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever done what that song suggests? Count your blessings. Count them, everyone. Count them. Name them one by one. Have you ever done that? Just sit down sometime. Turn off the TV. And just say, Lord, here's the blessings that you have given to me. Name them one by one. You will be shocked. You will be blessed. And our hearts are grateful for all that God has done. And notice that we're to always give thanks. The the presence of the Spirit within us causes us to to live in continual gratitude, continual thankfulness. And really, as believers, there's no situation in which we can't thank God for. Now, we may not be able to be thankful for our circumstances right now. Uh, We may not be thankful for what's happening in our lives, our situations. But if nothing else, we can say, God, thank you that you are with me. Thank you, God, that I am not alone, that you are walking with me. What a wonderful thing to know that God will never leave us nor forsake us. In the high places, he's with us. In the deep, deep, deep low places. He is with us. The text says that we're to always be giving thanks for everything. Reminds us of another book that Paul wrote, 1 Thessalonians, in 5.18. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. And listen to this. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And, And God is longing for us, even in the tough times, to be praising him and thanking him for all that he has done. Again, the fact that he is with us. In every situation, there's a reason to give thanks. Now let's admit it, unless you're different than me, you're more spiritual than me, it's not always easy to do it in those tough times. When, when your wife is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I wish I could tell you that the first thing I did was praise God and thank God. It wasn't. I had to work through some confusion and doubt and, and fear and all those things. It's not easy to thank God when your 10-month-old daughter has skull and brain surgery. And I wish I could tell you that in the midst of that, I thanked God. But I didn't. 
I had to deal with doubt and fear and confusion. But as we work through that, we say, God, thank you. Thank you for what you have done and what you will do. And if nothing else, we thank him for his grace that enables us to get through those things. And then finally, we see that we are to give thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when it says his name, it doesn't mean that we say, thank you, Jesus, in your name, amen. In, in, in the New Testament and Old Testament, when it says in the name of, it's talking about praying with the character of that person. It's not just repeating his name. It's saying, God, I, 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 I'm praying in, in your nature, in who you are. I'm giving thanks because you dwell within me. Because it is your nature to be thankful, then I want to be thankful. His nature has been given to us. And so we're thankful to God. God is so worthy of our thankfulness. So worthy. It doesn't matter where we've been, where we are, where we're going. He is worthy of our gratitude. So, so, so worthy. He's the author of our salvation. He's the one to whom all of our praise is due. There is going to come a time, beloved, when we are going to, if we're a believer and we die in Christ, we're going to come before his throne and we're going to bow and we're going to worship and praise him. And in those difficult times, when we're dealing with doubt and fear and confusion and all those things, that's when we remember that. God, I thank you in the midst of all this garbage that's going on in my life. I thank you that one day I'm going to kneel before your throne. And I'm going to bow before you. And I'm going to acknowledge that you are the king. We have the privilege to give thanks to him then. But beloved, don't waste it. Do it now. Don't wait until you get to the throne. May it be that you do that because your life is a life of gratitude. That upward attitude of gratitude. And the inward result of joy. But finally, Paul throws one more thing into the mix. He says that the presence of the Spirit within us produces an outward result that we call humility. Humility. In verse 21, he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Do you hear that? I don't submit to you necessarily because of who you are. I submit to you because of the reverence of Christ. And if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Christ, I'm submitting to that within you. Submitting has not been an easy thing in my life. For many years, I, I didn't do much submitting to anybody or anything. Kind of thought I had all the answers. And I kind of got called on a lot of that and came to see that I wasn't obeying God. And the reason that we submit to one another is because, because God has played us, placed us in this Christian community that we call a church. I love the church. And you say, well, you should. It pays your salary. No, no. I'm a pastor because I love the church. That's where I became a pastor. I left a good government job. $15,000 a year cut in salary to become a pastor. And I've never regretted it. I love the church. But let me tell you this. I also need the church. I need each of you in my life. And let me just say something to you off, off topic. 
I was just saying to my wife last week, Rosewood is blessed to have, and yes, I will use this word, I'm sorry, to have some really old faithful saints. You are such a blessing. Such a blessing. And I encourage you to make the best and the best use of your wisdom. And take some of the younger people under your wing. Because we need you. See, I was telling you that I'm young and you're not. But we need you. Please, please seek someone that you can help and just take them under your wing. Help them to live as a believer. We are placed in this community because we need the ministry of each member in our lives. Their safety in the community of the church. I have people that are looking out for me, that you have people that are looking out for you. I have people that help me to make, to avoid or even making serious mistakes. And I have people that say, Dan, you're on the wrong trail. You need to deal with this in a different way. If we submit to the wisdom and the guidance of correction that comes from fellow believers. Many of you know I went through a difficult church experience. And I left that church and I was hurt. I was confused. Had lots of doubts. In fact, I had decided at that time, I'm never going to pastor ever again. I was burned out. So how long did it take me to go back to church? One week. The next week after I resigned, I was in another church. Why? Because I need the church. Especially at a time like that, I needed the church. You need us. We need each other. I need you. You need me. And that's why it's so important for us to be a part of the church. God can lift us up through the well-chosen words and actions of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And oftentimes he uses the most unlikely people to speak truth into our lives, to get a message through to us. He could speak audibly, but he doesn't usually do that. He usually uses people In the Christian community, we don't have the privilege of doing whatever we want. Because as we heard this morning to the new members, I represent Christ. But also right now, I represent Rosewood Park Church. And I don't have the right to live however I want. I submit to you. I'm accountable to you. But to do that, I have to have humility. To do that, I have to be willing to hear from you. And humility is a work of the Spirit inside. To be truly humble, it means that the Spirit is in charge. And as we submit to one another, uh, we do so with the expectation that God will meet us through that other person. That as I submit... God meets me in places I never dreamed. We are really submitting, as I said earlier, not to to you as a person, but submitting to the Christ that is in you. It's a responsibility in our part to live as one led by the Spirit. So when we share with others, we're not just sharing our opinion. We are sharing Christ within us. A couple of weeks ago, the pastor, associate pastor of the church uh, that we attend in Moose Jaw gave me a call, said, can we have lunch? I want to talk to you about something. So we went and and he told me about a a change he was thinking of making in his life. And he had talked to his pastor, the senior pastor, but he wanted to talk to me. And I was 
overwhelmed with the responsibility that what I said could play a part in his life changing for the good or the worse. Because he wasn't looking at what Dan Pope had wanted to say, what Dan Pope's opinion was. He was wanting to know what I felt the Spirit was saying to me and to him. We're seeking to share the mind of Christ. And when I come to you and say, hey, I, I, I need to talk to you about something, I'm looking for the mind of Christ in you. We're seeking to hear what Christ might be saying through them. So joy, gratitude, humility, these are at least three results of spirit-filled living. And it all begins in verse 18 with this command to be filled with the spirit. The path to spirit-filled living is surrender. Surrender ourselves to the spirit's control. Ask him to fill you. And as he does, he will produce these and other qualities, other blessings within you. So just as we close, what are some things that we can do? First of all, the first thing is renew your focus on God daily. That doesn't mean you're walking away from God, that you're backsliding, but every day just say, God, I, I, today I am acknowledging that you are the focus of my life today. Seek the filling of the Spirit daily. Every day, in your morning prayer time or, or whatever, say, God, fill me with your Spirit today. I surrender to your Spirit. Give me the humility to live according to what he's called me to do. Seek joy in the Lord. Seek gratitude in the Lord. Seek humility in the Lord. Please understand, if you want joy in your life, you want gratitude, you want humility in your life, the solution is not to grit your teeth and try harder. In fact, it's the opposite. We say, God, I can't be a joyful person without you. I can't be a thankful person without you. I can't be a humble person without you. So please, fill me with those blessings as I walk by your spirit. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for your spirit. As we sang earlier, that you left your spirit until... The work, the work that you've called us to do is done. And so we submit to you. And Father, I pray that we would see a spiritual awakening at Rosewood Park as we seek to be those who live by your spirit, who live lives surrendered your spirit, live lives that are keeping in step with your spirit. Amen.